And we'll start with shifting, and we'll do vertical first, horizontal second. So these are all transformations. shifts. This is where you just take it and either move it horizontally or vertically some amount. So the shape stays the same, but the coordinates move left, right, up, or down. So we'll go vertical first. So vertical. If g of x equals f of x plus h, then the graph of G is the graph of F shifted up H units. And usually to be lazy, we'll just draw an up arrow with an H next to it. So that takes care of a lot of all those words. So move it up, H units. What happens if H is negative? We go up negative three units. So that means go down. So we'll make a big deal about H being positive or negative. Just negative means down. Positive is shift up. So it's vertical, horizontal. Start out with the same g of x equals, you pronounce this the same way, f of x plus h. I'm going to write it as minus h, except now the minus h is inside the parentheses. So if this is your function, then the graph of g is the graph of f shifted right h units. And we'll use the right arrow to show this. So we got a vertical shift, a horizontal shift, the shifts, you know you're having a shift instead of a stretch because you're doing addition subtraction. And vertically, if you're doing addition, you're moving up and subtraction moving down. Horizontally, it's the opposite. If it's x plus a number, you're moving left. If it's x minus a number, you're moving to the right. So it always shifts the opposite way, horizontally the opposite way it looks. And we'll do an example before we get into stretches. So we'll graph three functions. G of x will be square root x plus 3. And h of x will be square root x. Actually, let's get crazy. We'll write it as negative 4 plus square root x. So first function, we'll graph that. Just writing it out a uh, table of values, one way to do it, or you can just remember what the square root function looks like. And we'll just plot two of the points and then sketch it out from there. So we have 0, 0, 1, 1, and the square root function. We're not really using the clueless method because at this point we know what the square root function graph looks like. So we don't need to put too many points on the actual graph. <coughs> so this is our f of x graph. Now, 
g of x, what transformation is happening to f to get the g of x function? So there's a plus 3. So yes, yeah, so it will act like a minus 3. So it's going to, well, yeah, to the left. Yeah, so we'll be shifting to the left. So we're going left three units. And you could label your points 1, 1, 0, 0. If you're not a visual person, it might be good to label your points and you're just taking three away from each x coordinate. So you're lowering your x coordinates by three. So there's your two transformed points, and the shape of the graph is going to be exactly the same. And this was g of x equals square root x plus 3. So last function, let's rewrite this function. We'll write it as square root x minus 4. So we'll put the function part in the front and the shift, the plus or minus at the end. So do we have horizontal or vertical shift? Vertical. So we got vertical and it is it looks negative and vertical always is what it looks like. So this will be a shift down four. So I like to draw arrow down four. You could, if you want to, go up negative four however you want to write it. It's a little silly if you're going to have a, a shift up to sh draw as a shift down negative. That's a little bit redundant. But I think for a shift down, you could either draw a down arrow or up with a negative sign. Now remember, we're shifting the graph f, not the graph g. So we're looking at the graph on the left. We could tell there's the next intercept. We could find it pretty easily if we wanted to. And now we'll get to, so your calculus textbook calls it scaling. It was called uh, stretching or compressing back in the pre-calculus book, but it's all the same thing. So this is scaling. Do vertical first. So scaling is always multiplying. I should say multiplication or division. So all your shifting was addition and subtraction. All your scaling is going to be multiplication or division. So g of x equals a, a number a times f of x. Then the graph of g. is the graph of f stretched horizontally or stretched vertically by a. <coughs> the way we write this, we use a double arrow up and down with a next to it. So this signifies that we're stretching by a. This one could be a lot harder to see, especially if you're not a visual person, because your shape actually gets deformed, especially if it's negative. It'll flip upside down, and then 
possibly also get deformed. So if you're not a visual person, uh, another way to think about the stretching is you're going to multiply all your y coordinates by a. So this is the multiplication, you're going to multiply all your y coordinates by a. So the algebraic effect You multiply your y coordinates by a. <clears throat> so the best way to think about this, if you're you can't do it with your paper because you'll rip your paper up, but if your paper was um, some type of like silly putty material or rubber, you could take it and stretch it out. And the x-axis, the middle of your paper, if you stretch the top and the bottom the same amount, technically wouldn't move at all. This you couldn't really do this, at least not with your hands. Uh, but if you stretched it the x-axis won't move. Every, every point moves basically further away from the x-axis if it's a stretch or closer if it's a compression. So if your A is, we'll write some conditions on A. Uh, we'll do absolute value of A bigger than one. You're going to be stretching. So this will be away from the x-axis. If absolute value of A is less than 1, meaning A is small, you're going to be uh, stretching or compressing towards the x-axis. So you can think of that as uh, compressing or compacting. Compressing toward the x-axis. So I use absolute value on purpose. So I compare the absolute value of A to 1. If it's bigger than 1 and you multiply, it's going to get bigger. If it's smaller than 1 uh, and you multiply, it's going to get smaller. Of course, all that's not true if things are negative. Because uh, if you multiply by a negative value, it depends on if your number is positive or negative, whether your output is going to be bigger or smaller. Uh, so when I say bigger or smaller, I just mean bigger magnitude number. And if A is negative, what effect does that have? You multiply by a number that is negative. What type of stretch or what additional effect happens when you stretch? Yeah, it'll be a reflection. And again, if you're not a visual person, this algebraic effect is very useful and applies no matter what A is. If A is big, small, positive, negative, you just multiply your y coordinates by that A, and you will have your uh, effect right here. You will have your stretch. So that's vertical. Horizontal is similar. use the same letter a but we'll use a lowercase a so g of x equals f of ax then the graph of g stretched horizontally by, so on this is the opposite of what it looks like. It looks like you should multiply your x-coordinates by a, but horizontal is always the opposite. So the opposite of multiplying by a is either dividing by a or multiplying by 1 over a. So that will be the opposite of multiplying by a. So we'll write it as a reciprocal, 1 over a, and we do a very similar symbol that double arrow horizontally and just going to be the reciprocal
reciprocal of a or 1 over a. Algebraic effect. It's almost the exact same. You're going to multiply all your x coordinates. by 1 over a. Looks like you're multiplying by a, but you're going to do the opposite. So if 1 over a, if you multiply by uh, a number bigger than 1, when 1 over a is bigger than 1, you're going to be stretching. So that would be a horizontal stretch. Which we said was, this will be away from the y-axis. If 1 over a is less than 1, we have a compression. This is toward, towards the y-axis. And we have the same uh, situation occur if 1 over a is negative, we have a reflection. In this case, we'll be reflecting across y-axis. And again, you're not a visual person. Then think about the algebraic effect. You're going to multiply your x-coordinates by 1 over a. So if that's negative, your x-coordinates are going to be negative of what they started. And we'll do a couple problems. So we'll, we'll do that same base function, that square root x, and we'll graph two different transform versions. So first graph, g of x equals 2 times square root x. So this is definitely going to be a stretch. Is it horizontal or vertical? All your horizontals are always right next to your x. So this is not right next to the x, it's outside the square root. So this will be a vertical stretch by 2. So if you're an algebraic person, you're going to multiply your y coordinates by 2. And I will flip back to the square root graph right here so you don't have to redraw it. You can just look at it on the board. So I want you to graph that transformation of the square root graph that's on the left. So your original point at the origin, that was at 0, 0. Multiply your y-coordinate by 0, and that's not going to move. And your other coordinate has a y-coordinate 1, multiply by 2, and that's going to move up to 2. So your function basically just gets twice as tall as it was before, or stretch vertically by 2. So we'll graph one more. We'll do square root 
4x. So this is a horizontal trans uh, stretch. Is it horizontal stretch by 4? What do we stretch horizontally by? One over four. So we're going to go reciprocal. It looks like we're multiplying by rx coordinates by four, but we're doing the opposite. We're multiplying by one fourth. So it looks like it should be getting four times wider. It's actually going to get one fourth as wide. So it's going to get a lot more narrow. So regraph. And I will jump back to the square root function. I'll put a second point in here. So we'll put the point 4.2 on your square root graph. So you have a point that's more reasonable to stretch. That 1.1 one, one point is going to stretch really close to the y-axis. So this point will be easier. So if you really wanted to transform that point that was at 1, 1, it's going to move to 1, 1 fourth. So if I label it, it'll be 1, 1 fourth. Of course, 0, 0 doesn't move. And then I also put the point 4, 2, which moves to 1, 2. Whoa. Those coordinates are wrong. That should be one fourth one. One fourth one, and then one two. And we connect these together. So these two graphs are the same. The G graph and the H graph are the same. So depending on your function shape, if you stretch it one direction, it might be the same graph as if you stretch it a different amount in a different direction. And it completely depends on your function as to what stretch horizontally might correspond to a compression vertically or vice versa. And algebraically, you can see that very easily. Square root 4x is square root 4, square root x, which of course squared 4 is 2 squared x. So algebraically they're the same function. And you can apply, as long as you're careful with the transformation, you can transform it either way and you better get to the same graph. This will be our last example. We'll start with our f of x function. So we'll start out with f of x equals x squared plus 4. And part 1. G is F compressed horizontally by a half. Uh, 
Actually, let me just draw the symbols. And this transfer in the order I write them is the order to perform them. So we're going to do a horizontal stretch by or a compression by a half, then a y axis reflection. then translate or shift two units down. We can combine the first two. So you can put the first two together. So if you do a, hor a horizontal reflection, and you can do that at the same time you do a horizontal compression or a stretch. So if I put them together, what is one transformation that will take care of both of these at the same time? So how do I do a y-axis reflection and this compression at the same time? So just make it a negative one half. And it will have the effect of compressing and reflecting at the same time. It'd be different if it was reflected across the x-axis. That would be a different story. I couldn't do that reflection in a horizontal stretch. So we could combine and do horizontal stretch by negative one half and then shift down to. So we'll do the, the stretch first. So is this correct to s compress the graph one half horizontally? It's certainly a horizontal stretch or compression because we're multiplying and it's multiplying on the x. So we're in the right category, but is that the right number? So the negative is okay, but what part of it is not okay? So if it's on the outside, we'd be doing a vertical um, stretch, but we do have to do the opposite of what it looks like. So we got to turn the reciprocal, the negative one half, to a negative two. So that's wrong. We're going to write it as a negative two x, like that. So that takes care of the negative one half stretch. Actually, this isn't g of x. This is almost g of x, we'll call this h of x. So how do I do a horizontal, a uh, vertical shift down to? Add, subtract, multiply, divide. Subtract. Do I do it inside the function or outside? Outside. So I'll write it like this. Take the h function and then bring it down to. So that'll be a vertical shift down to. And we can write that as we said h of x was f of negative 2x minus 2. If we really want to, we could plug in negative 2 up here for x, negative 2x. So function composition is a little bit tricky. This is a good time to talk about it. I'm going to do some strange things to f. First thing I'm going to do is feed it a box. What does f do with whatever it inputs? It squares it and subtracts 4. So that's what f does. Takes the input, squares it, subtracts 4. So what I'm going to do is feed f negative 2x. Let me go back to go back to the black marker here. So function composition on one hand takes almost no thought, but on the other hand is commonly uh, not done correctly. 
So if you're thinking when you're doing function composition, you're probably not doing it right. So I'm only taking negative 2x and I'm basically filling it inside that box right there. That's all I'm doing. So that's going to look like, and we use parentheses to group this up. Square minus 4. Whoa, well, I should probably make a plus four. Or we will not have the red function, yeah. So it takes that input, squares it, and then adds four to it. And depending on what you're doing, you may want to square this whole term. Negative two times negative two is positive four. X squared plus four. You may want to factor the four out. Just depends on what you're doing. I'm going to leave it in this form. So we got four X squared plus four. I'm going to fill that in for f of negative 2x. And copy down the minus 2. We have 4x squared plus 4 minus 2 is plus 2. Now, if I just read this function off, it looks like there's a vertical stretch by 4 and then a vertical shift up by 2 which is very different than the transformations we took to get here. We did a horizontal reflection by negative one half, or negative two, depending on which way you want to talk about it. But we did a horizontal reflection and stretch, and in our final version, it looks like it's a vertical. I could make this look horizontal with some algebra. So take 4x squared, and that is 2x times 2x, right there. So I can algebraically make this vertical stretch look like it's horizontal. And of course, we just saw before, negative 2x squared is the same as regular 2x squared. So that horizontal stretch we saw didn't actually do anything to the graph. It already had y-axis symmetry, so it didn't change the shape. And these are all things that we can see algebraically without actually looking over at the graph. Quick question. Yeah. Uh, could you have skipped a few steps and just plugged in the one half on, uh, onto the x and then you get the 2x squared? And then since it's already just going down, subtract the 2 from the 4 and get the negative 2x. Um, maybe I had to be careful about the order that they occurred in so I couldn't shift well in this case I could swap the order but in general if you're stretching and shifting both horizontally or both vertically the order is very important um, this one I kind of dodged that problem because I did one horizontal and one vertical transformation so you can when they're in different axes you can do them whatever order you want but it's when you have a shift and a stretch in the same axis, you have to be careful about the order. Uh, which isn't your question. Or it's not the answer to your question, I don't think, but I'm not, I'm not sure what your question was. There's other ways to go about getting that final version right there. Okay. Yeah, definitely. And you know, what's the right form for it? I would say this one's decent right here. This one just depends on what you're doing. They're both pretty decent. The last one was useful because we could see the transformation in the uh, layout that we started with. So it just depends on what you're trying to, uh, to look at. But if I was going to graph this function, I could graph, I'd probably graph uh, the two with the arrow, one of the two with the arrows next to it, is what I would do. I like vertical transformations, so I'd probably go with the, the one that has two vertical transformations and no horizontal. So that should be enough from 1.2. So it's basically pre-calculus one in a nutshell, in two sections. We did a quarter. We skipped all like the fun linear algebra. We don't do logarithms and exponential functions at all in Calc 1. So that's all in Calculus 2. Uh, whenever, if either next quarter or never, depending on what your math plans are. But you won't see any logs or exponentials in Calc 1. 
So now we're into 1.3. Uh, your quiz on Friday is definitely going to cover 1, 1, and 1, 2. So chapter 1.3 is trigonometry. So this is a review of pre-calculus 2 class. I th think everything should be a review. At the very end, we do an inequality that will be, I think will be new. But up until then, everything should be reviewed in this section. So we'll mostly use radians. So if you're not sure what measure, what the angle is measured in, it's most likely radians. Almost always with degrees, you'll see a degree symbol written down. That little uh, zero in the looks like an exponent to the zero power, but it's a degree. But we're mostly going to use radians. And we'll start with arc length. So we measure in theta in radians. too big of a circle. Sorry, let me get to the right size, a better size grid. That should work. Only, I've only gotten this to work for circles. There we go. That makes my axis look so bad. <laughs> oh well. So we have theta. We have r is the radius right here. The arc length, we'll write that with uh, the blue marker. So the arc length is if you traveled around the circle on the boundary or the perimeter from the angle zero to whatever your final angle is right there. And this arc length is going to be S. Uh, this arc length, which is the uh, distance traveled along the perimeter. And the formula is S equals R theta. So it's distance along the perimeter from angle zero to angle theta. So that's arc length. So now we'll go talk about degrees and radians. So these are angle measurement units. So degrees, 360 degrees equals one rotation counterclockwise. Radians, 
means 2 pi equals 1 rotation counterclockwise. Those are our two units. And both of these are 1 rotation counterclockwise. So that means 360 degrees is the same as 2 pi. You don't generally write radians, but if you wanted to, I'll write it with a really small font. Ooh. So you could write rads afterwards, or radians, if you want to write the whole thing out. Because we're always going to use radians, we won't keep writing radians, though. And you could solve for one degree. And one degree will be just divide both sides by 360. So one degree is 2 pi over 360 rads. You can also solve for uh, one radian. So if you divide both sides by 2 pi, And we can reduce that. One radian is 180 degrees divided by pi. And I told you where pi came from in pre-calculus class. So really quickly, where does pi come from? Definition of pi. Pi is C over D, where C equals circumference of circle, and D is diameter of circle. Now, it doesn't matter what size the radius is. This is independent of the radius of the circle. So that takes a little more geometry uh, to see that it doesn't matter what size your circle is, but this will be good enough for us. So if you think of a circle and the diameter, pi is the uh, circumference. So the circumference would, uh, if you want to think about it visually, you could unwind this, so sort of unwrap it, kind of like your carefully peeling some type of orange or something. And if you laid the uh, peel all the way out, it might look something like this. And the measurement of the uh, unwound circumference divided by diameter is pi. And it's, three point, it's close to 3.14. So I'm just going to write some scribbles after that because it's irrational. You're not really supposed to write dot, dot, dot because that implies there's a pattern. We reserve three dots for it continues and there's an obvious pattern. There is no pattern here, so it would be misleading to write dot, dot, dot. So is the official thing to do a squiggle? Or is no. The official thing to do is uh, emphasize the uh, approximate equal sign right there. So what you do is you say pi is approximately equal to this number. So that's what you use when you're uh, talking about an estimate. So I think web work, your answer has to be, if it's a numerical answer, it has to be accurate to, I think, within about 1% of the correct answer. Uh, which, depending on the magnitude of the answer, that can be a different number of digits, decimal digits, but usually about five decimal digits and you'll be plenty safe. So if you're using pi, this number should work for most. If you need a decimal approximation for pi, this number should work for most of the web work problems.